Well, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to the, what month are we in? We're in January of 2024. So this happy new year, everybody. We haven't uh, done an event yet in 2024. So uh, it's good to see everybody's faces. We've got a lot of people joining that uh, hasn't joined in a while. So it's really nice to, to see all the new faces and stuff or old faces that have not been joined. So yeah, <laughs> good, welcome. And for those of you joining online after the fact, thanks for joining. Uh, be sure to hit that like and smash the subscribe or whatever that is that all these content creators say to do. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's supposed to help with the algorithms or something in the YouTube sphere. Yeah. But um, no, thanks for everybody joining. Uh, we've got a, a action packed one uh, for tonight. And let me just remind everybody, if you are not uh, talking, please mute. Uh, that way we can uh, not get the feedback uh, that's uh, coming through. So tonight, let me get my screen shared here. Some of you may actually be joining because you heard that we're going to preview DNN 10 tonight. Yay, woo. What, 10? Really? How many years has it been since a major release? I should have looked this up. That would have been a neat little statistic to, to know, but it was a long time ago when DNN 9 came out. And uh, that was back in the... Uh, Seven years or eight years if I, ugh, gosh, let me try to see if I can look. <laughs> that would be a good one to know. Chime in when you figure it out. Um, it, it's, I know a lot of the minor releases have kind of been probably enough to call it DNN 10, but for many different reasons, I guess it has never gotten that mantra on it, uh, that stamp of DNN 10. So it's going to be exciting to see that. Uh, tonight, but uh, before we jump into that, let's jump into a few little community announcements. One of the biggest ones that I had on my list is the new DNA community look and feel on the uh, DNA community site. So dnncommunity.org, uh, check that out. It's a great new look and feel uh, that uh, some folks have contributed uh, to the site, and I know that's going to be an ongoing effort to uh, refine and improve and so forth. But uh, Already seeing a lot of compliments on that, so be sure to check that out. Still the same content that you would expect out there. Some of it's been tweaked for the new design, it seems, um, but for the most part, everything's in the same place that you would expect it to, to be. Um, see, have there been any new blogs recently? Okay, so that's a good segue into another big announcement, the release of DNN 9.13.2. This is just a maintenance release, but it does have some important things in it. Uh, so be sure to check that out. And I didn't even realize that blog was out here uh, <laughs> on this, but uh, it's kind of cool. It showed up first. Um, Will Stroll posted a blog out here on the new uh, community site, Look and Feel. Many of you may have seen that, but that was done nine days ago. And uh, yeah, I guess we had a release of MV Quick Theme 3.1.0. And there was a big release of DNN Community Forms. I know they have been, uh, it seems like it's every few minutes we're seeing a new PR come in on the Forms project over there. John Henley and I think Timo uh, and uh, Will Stroll, they've been doing a lot of work to try to help the Community Forms area of the site. And then there was a blog post about a month ago, but I don't think we had it in time for our last meetup, um, which I think was actually in November, right? Well, we had the the family feud one in uh, December, I guess, but uh, not sure if we mentioned this or not, but uh, the opening of the DNN Connect 2024 conference in Chomfrey. Um, The other one is coming up very soon here. We've got DNN Summit, uh, February the 7th and 8th. It's virtual. Uh, through the hop-in platform. If you have not registered, check it out and register. Um, you'll see that the speakers and sessions uh, for the conference, you know, this one surprised me. I saw Ash out here. So he's presenting something, Mitch. Looks like he's uh, doing something on us. That, that, is, that is a brand new blast from the past as of like a week ago. Yeah. Um, nice. He's... Got, he has got a new business doing consulting uh, in the DNN space as an independent. Awesome. Good to see him uh, present or uh, post something in there to present. So 
know some people will recognize that face. Um, yeah, so lots of great speakers lined up for out here. And uh, we've got the sessions. Uh, if you're interested in digging through those and see what kind of tickles your fancy there for uh, subject matter. And also the schedule. Um, so I believe last year kind of the kinks were worked out of this, but uh, you'll notice that all the time zone stuff is <laughs> kind of, it'll convert to whatever your local time zone is and your browser and so forth. And I think uh, Sessionize has done a great job of kind of fixing that. So it shouldn't be any huge confusion on <laughs> what time it's starting and stuff for this year. But I think things kick off on Wednesday, the 7th of February at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. So uh, be sure to check that out. And as a reminder, when you do register for this event, um, you will be able to watch the playbacks of all the sessions. So if you are unable to join more than one at a time. <laughs> now, I know so the reason I say it like that is some people, they have their multiple monitors and they just kind of watch all three uh, tracks at the same time. So uh, I can't focus that well. But uh, if, if you're like me, you'll have to go back and look at some of those after the fact. But you will be able to do that for, I think, um, Mitch, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's for one year um, after the event. That's correct. Yeah, maybe um, one, maybe one for a full year, year. after. And it should be within about, it, it takes about an hour to an hour and a half after a session ends before it gets released to be able to view the replay. So there's a little bit of a delay, but you know, by the end of the, by the end of the day, all of the sessions from that day will be available. That's great. It, it worked out pretty well last year, I believe. I know I was able to catch a few, a few days after the event and uh, kind of spread them out over time there. So that's really nice. Let's see, am I missing anything else big in the community? Of course, this is uh, the DNN Connect site, dnn-connect.org. Um, you could also do it without the dash. I think it'll get there, but uh, upcoming event, in-person event in May, again in Champery, Switzerland, um, as they have been last year. And that'll be the 23rd through the 26th. Um, had a great time last year. It was a good good event. Of course, it's quite different, as we say almost every time we talk about it. It's a little different than what you would expect to go, you know, like at a DNN Summit event. Um, and they both are wonderful in their own regards. Um, but I highly recommend give you a chance to travel a little bit, too, if you haven't been to Switzerland. It's absolutely stunning there. Let's see. Um, I think that's it for my announcements. Um, anything else that's noteworthy out there that I really kind of missed or, or skimmed over? No, I was just going to make that extra push for DNM Summit registrations and the videos was the best speaking angle for the moment. Uh, you mentioned that you've got a year to watch those. So everyone's had a year to watch all of the past ones. So if you're not sure about registering or not sure you're going to have time during the week uh, to spend, you know, the, the whole block of time and attend sessions even within one day, remember that you've got that annual time period to watch back those videos and uh, soak up all that new information and new updates uh, from all of the speakers. So it's definitely well worth the registration, even if you can't make it the full time during the week, you'll have access to watch the rest of it later. Thanks, Ryan. Also, um, next month for our Southern Fried DNN meetup, we will be having, or at least the plans are at this point, on February the 15th uh, to have a recap and uh, kind of a hangout afterwards. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the sessions and things that we experienced, what people learned, what they thought was cool, what they thought sucked. You know, maybe we'll have some of that in there too. So, <laughs> but uh, come and join us for that. And Ryan's going to facilitate a conversation around all that. And now I think it's time left over. We'll just do a general hangout and kind of, hey, what you've been doing lately in the DNN space? Um, those are always fun because sometimes people talk about, well, I really did this really cool project and I want to show you this. And, <laughs> you know, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Um, so come and check that out. And if you have any cool little, uh, five, 10 minute shares or something that uh, you'd like to like to show that would probably be a good opportunity to do a little show and tell. Um, I want to turn this over to Mitch here in a second, but um, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about DNN 10. Now, 
probably the big question a lot of you have in your mind is like, well, when's it going to happen? Well, I mean, soon. That's the answer. Uh, soon could be, you know, a month. Uh, soon could be three months. We don't know the exact time and date that it'll be released. So um, just go ahead and squash that bug right up front <laughs> on that. But uh, what what the intent of this is, is really to um, give people a bit of an advanced kind of look into what's coming in DNTM. What are the big highlights? What are the big areas of focus? And um, I, I'll go ahead and pull up one screen here. Um, I won't talk about anything in detail, but if you come out to the DNN platform on GitHub and you go to either issues or to pull requests, I'll just go through the path here and then click on milestones and then the 10.0.0 milestone, you'll see a ton of closed issues or PRs that are out here as well as whatever's open right now. So as you see right now, we only have three three issues open. One of them is, well, two issues open and one uh, pull request uh, here that's a work in progress. Um, but if you look through some of the closed ones, you'll see a ton of stuff that's gotten done and it, it goes for days. I mean, there's 150 of them here. So if you want more detail about what's going to be in DNN, you may find something that's been you know, lingering for a while that you wanted to see done. Maybe it's been addressed in 10. Maybe it had to wait because a lot of times the decision on where it's going to be put into um, DNN is following semantic versioning. So if it is a it requires a breaking change, then, you know, it may need to go into a major release. If it has a new feature or something like that, it'll go into the new release. But um, with that, uh, Mitch, I don't know if you have anything to share on screen. Um, I could just kind of leave things up here, but uh, I want to turn it over to you and kind of give everybody kind of an overview of uh, DNN 10. Yeah, no, I don't have anything necessarily to share um, on the screen, but uh, really, um, you know, one of the biggest things I wanted to address was a little bit more of the, the the how and the why. One of the questions I see a lot too is, well, okay, we keep pushing out nine X releases. Why are we, you know, why don't we just get ten out and get ten done? And I think the the concept of semantic versioning is is really important to kind of balance the expectation of a major release needs to have you know some meat to it, some features to it. And so the original game plan for 10, um, for those of you that would have attended, for example, uh, DNN Summit last year, was that DNN 10 was going to be the Telerik free version and, you know, some of those kinds of things. And, and we had to zigzag a little bit um, due to just a number of obligations and, and being right in the community, um, which resulted in a few more 9X releases than what we were originally planning. Um, as well as, um, you know, I don't want, we don't want to release, as we talked to it as a community, a major release that had developer only features. Um, releasing a major version 10 that the only feature was we removed a bunch of APIs and made breaking changes just didn't really seem to fit the bill. Um, so there were multiple conversations with within the technology advisory group that meets every other Tuesday, um, as well as within our get approvers group that, you know, does the pull request reviews and things like that of, you know, what were kind of our minimum threshold things of like, what do we need to see um, before we can, you know, call it a version 10. And so we started down some, you know, general lines of high level requirements. One of those being a new theme, which I believe David will probably talk about that a little bit later. Um, some additional support for some more modern styling of themes, um, the uh, removal of APIs that had been marked as, you know, being removed, as well as um, some new features and integrating some community contributions. Um, PolyDeploy um, is a component for bulk module installation or remote module installation um, via like automated build processes. Um, it was contributed to the platform, but it needs some user interface work before we can bring it in. Um, all of these things kind of resulted in a more feature complete, you know, we have a little bit of something for everybody with the 10X release. And so 
as time has gone on, we've been really diligent in making sure that whatever things come in, if they're not a breaking change or they're not a, a new feature or something like that that needs to be held, you know, we've been trying to get those incorporated into the individual 9X releases. So a great example of that is 9.13.2. Um, that release, in my mind, is a really, really important release because it improves the behavior with the resource manager that has caused some real technical troubles for some folks. Mm -hmm. So um, the emphasis, the, yeah, uh, yeah, way too many backups from uh, sites restored from backups over the last couple of months. Um, but the general idea, right, is to try to be able to have tangible items. As David mentioned, the timeline of this is where things get really hard. Um, you know, we are 100% community volunteer driven. And I, I can't, I know that many of the people that are already here are aware of this, but we have many that are newer to the community that don't necessarily understand this. Um, yes, Evoke is there, um, but I wanna be really clear. Um, 97, maybe higher percent of all of the contributions for recent releases, including the 10X release, have all been from community members that are not compensated for anything that they do. So um, what that means is we are subject to when everybody has um, time and availability. So as much as we want to get 10X out as quick as possible, um, we are at the mercy of um, the individuals that have the time to commit. And one of the things that I think um, is really worth noting and applauding um, Dana Vladis and, and David here, um, the community co-coding sessions that they've been doing over um, the last, I don't know how long, six, nine months that those have been going on now, um, has been a great way to introduce others to kind of see a little bit behind the curtain how some of these things get done. Um, how to work with the platform and has resulted in a number um, of those pull requests that David's mentioning as being um, out there and incorporated either some things that have been in um, one of the nine X releases or things that have been there in um, 10. Um, from a product perspective, I think the most important thing to understand with 10 is um, the final, one of the final features that we're working to finalize is how are we going to address the DNN doesn't distribute with Telerik anymore um, behavior? Um, we're trying to get more aggressive with the upgrade path to say, if you're on 10, you don't have Telerik. And so we're looking at some protections. We're looking at some methods to be able to address that with the least amount of risk to um, installations, uh, but we are trying to be very, very clear that you need to get Telerik out. You need to be on the modern things. And, you know, if you download and install DNN 10, there should be a reasonable expectation that new install or upgrade results in a product that is secure. Um, so that's been one of the real big guiding lights, uh, not only from a community perspective, but from an obligation perspective that we have as as community leaders to make sure that we've met that target. Um, it's important that we do that to, to keep everybody happy and, and manage the sanity of um, what we might have out there. So my age old tribute for everybody is upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. Um, test the upgrades, test the release candidates as we have them out there, um, take religious backups, but get to those latest versions. Um, the performance improvements, just with some of the dependency updates that we've had, um, I know that 9.12.0 compared to uh, 9.11, um, there's a huge performance gain. And, uh, you know, those upgrades are fairly easy. And, uh, you know, an easy performance gain is a win-win for everybody. Um, and so I can't really encourage it more. If you are on the fence, you want to get involved, but don't know how, um, all contributions are valid. You don't have to be a developer um, submitting well-documented, I ran into this issue. That's just as, it's a valuable thing for the community, just like the person that actually submits the bug fix 
um, that results in that item being um, resolved. So really we're trying to move onward and upward with 10. Um, I do believe that we will get a little bit more aggressive in making some cleanup once we get past a couple of hurdles. Um, there's one additional roadmap item for um, a later release with regards to the HTML editor um, that will result in some fairly big changes, but we have, um, you know, we need to get some of those items scoped. Um, trying to think at a high level, David, is there anything else I'm missing? Um, I know we can't talk briefly. You got some stuff from yeah, well, you some of the developer centric stuff that Brian has. Yeah, one thing that might be interesting for people to know is the minimum dependency bumps uh, that came in this. I, I can't oh, know if you yes. mentioned that or not. No, so we are um, we are bumping the minimum dependencies uh, to SQL Server 2016 um, with the release of um, 10. And really what we're trying to do here is balancing um, Anything older than that, Microsoft isn't really supporting after, I believe it's like September of 2024, um, even in the extended you know, enterprise support channels. So by moving those dependency needles a little bit further forward, we're able to ensure that you know, we can use some of the newer technologies, gain you know, additional benefits, performance benefits and those kinds of things. So um, you know, as with everything else, Upgrading DNN is important. It's also important to upgrade your environments. So even though our minimums aren't at .NET 4.8, you know, upgrading the .NET framework and making sure that your servers are patched and secure um, is really important across the board. Um, but we are bumping those slightly. Um, our recommended Visual Studio version is going to be uh, Visual Studio 2022. Um, it's minor improvements there from a developer perspective. Um, and then Windows, I believe we've officially dropped 2008 R2 from our list of supported ones. I think we left Windows uh, 2012 out there. We will make sure to have a release note calling out the minimum version dependency updates when we go do that as well. Um, yeah. So just something to be aware of if you're running on a really old servers. And we'll also be sure to update the DNN docs uh, requirements out here as well to reflect some of those things that Mitch was just uh, mentioning here. But a lot of it follows the the end of life, you know, for those underlying um, solutions like SQL Server and, and those things. So kind of brings us a little more. And please, if you're on Windows Server two, if you're on Windows Server two thousand eight, please upgrade. Just yeah. please do it. Please. <laughs> it's really important. I hate. The, uh, but I'm going to lose my uh, Windows NT4 license? <laughs> um, or you cannot. I mean, and, and it is kind of worth noting, the SQL Server dependency, there is absolutely a risk that the app may not run. Um, I don't think, even with all the dependency upgrades that we've done, like... It may still work. I know that latest version DNN can run on a Windows um, a Windows 2000 box. I don't want to talk about why or how I know that, but uh, <laughs> you can. Um, I just don't recommend it. And it's not supported. And I think the biggest thing is when you go and submit an issue, um, one of the questions that we're often going to have is, what version are you on? What version of SQL Server are you on? What version of Windows are you on? Um, and it's solely for our diagnostic ability as, as community contributors. Um, and I guess the only other thing that is worth noting um, as just a general reminder to everybody, there is the security alias if you ever find an issue that is a security related item. Um, that goes into a secure channel. Um, please, please, please do not discuss security vulnerabilities in the forums. Please don't discuss them in open Git, uh, GitHub chats, in Discord, on Slack, or anything like that. Um, the security alias, it's linked from, if you go to submit a bug in GitHub and you say it's a security thing, it gives you all of the instructions on how to send it. Those items um, go into a secure um, communication portal. I am the one that primarily responds to those. 
um, but it keeps your information secure. It keeps the community secure with not sharing exploit information. I know that we've had like two or three posts in the last couple of months that we've had to delete um, just so that we didn't expose something. They were prior disclosures um, in many cases, um, things that had already been resolved. Um, but just remember that that is out there. Um, if you ever don't get a response, um, don't hesitate to reach out directly to myself or any one of the other approvals. We'll, we'll make sure to take a look at it. Um, but um, you know, I'm happy to report that um, from a security perspective, we're getting better and better with every release. Um, dependencies have been updated. More modern versions of stuff are in place. Like we're we're in a really good place overall. Fantastic, um, Mitch. I don't. Anything else that you uh, want to cover here? I, I I don't know that I have anything. I, I've got a few minutes here yet. I don't know if anybody has any specific questions for me because I unfortunately will have to drop off here to go deal with some kiddo duties. Um, but um, yeah, I don't have anything else right now. Yeah, does anybody have anything specific for Mitch? You know, just not, not on things that haven't been covered yet, but just things that he's covered there in general before he has to leave. We'll try to do some questions at the end of each person's uh, segment here as well. So speak now or forever hold your peace. All right. Well, thanks so much, Mitch, for uh, for joining us. If, if you have to drop, feel free to go ahead and do that. We'll continue on with the other pieces, but thanks for all your effort. Yeah, no, thanks. Appreciate everybody. I'll stick around for a little bit, but uh, great to be able to be here and sorry I have to run. No worries. Enjoy your evening. So uh, I saw one question pop up in the chat there, but I think that is, uh, I think I know the answer to that one. Uh, is there a preview of DNN 10 updated UI? Yeah, we'll, we'll be showing some of DNN 10 here in just a little bit uh, visually. Okay. Um, next up, what we've got is we've got uh, Brian Dukes, uh, who's going to cover a few things. Now, Brian couldn't be here tonight, but I do have him on video, and I'm going to uh, just play this. Uh, the sound should be sharing, but after it starts, if you would, just give me a thumbs up in the chat if you can hear it, um, or just say, yeah, I can hear it, you know, or something at the beginning, uh, just to make sure that it's coming through okay. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and start uh, Brian's segment here. Hi, Southern Fried. Uh, I wanted to let you know of a couple of the things that I have worked on for DNN 10 and uh, things that I'm excited to get to use before too long. Uh, they're all pretty low level uh, developer kinds of things. So the uh, first one is uh, a feature that's actually in DNN today, but it, it's it's an optional install, and we've made it a default install starting in DNN 10. Um, it's called a code DOM provider, uh, and basically that just means that you can use the latest version of C Sharp, uh, which latest in terms of uh, .NET Framework, so C Sharp uh, 7.3, I think. Um, in uh, the in any of the code that the website compiles. Um, so you, know, you can use even newer versions of C Sharp in anything that you compile into a DLL. Um, you know, any uh, C Sharp files that get compiled as part of uh, a module or other extension that you're creating. Uh, but as part of ASCX files uh, would be the biggest one, uh, but also, uh, I believe, Razor files. Uh, you can use some of those newer language features that may uh, cause you to run into issues trying to context switch between the back end code and the front end code. So that'll be set up by default in DNN 10. Uh, otherwise, the big thing that I've been working on 
has been around dependency injection um, and um, I guess so one thing to highlight is uh, another developer has uh, made a uh, a pull request that we've accepted, um, Gerard Smith, uh, and that is enabling dependency injection in web forms. So, um, you know, this is your, uh, you know, portal module base user controls, uh, as well as other things like, um, HTTP handlers and HTTP modules, um, any of those, uh, pieces that are typically managed by ASP.NET uh, web forms itself, uh, you should be able to start using constructor injection and getting uh, dependencies from DNN's dependency container. And then uh, we've been working to make dependency injection available in lots of other scenarios. Um, so that uh, with web forms is, is a big one. Um, but then some of the internal pieces that DNN uses um, is also going to uh, make uh, work with dependency injection. Um, we should have everything that gets created by DNN should be able to have dependencies injected through constructor injection. Um, that's kind of a base layer expectation now that you can just have a constructor of something so long as DNN is the one who's creating it. Um, and uh, that dependency in the constructor will get automatically supplied by DNN. Um, the kind of flip side of that is what you can register in the dependency injection container um, to make available to DNN. Um, and there are some components that use uh, an older dependency model. So there's the um, service locator, which gives you that dot instance property on things. Um, some of those uh, have been moved and some of them will get marked as deprecated, but um, you know, if those may or may not pull from the dependency injection container uh, based on kind of how far we've gotten through the process. Um, there's a component factory piece for uh, pieces of the framework older than the service locator. Um, and those again, like kind of pull and kind of don't. Um, so you should be able to depend on uh, one of those things, but you um, say like the caching provider, um, you could depend on caching provider and get the current caching provider, but you can't just register a new caching provider and then that magically becomes uh, available to everyone else as the caching provider. Um, there's uh, still a, a registration piece there. So that's uh, pretty much it for DNN 10, dependency injection. Um, the one other piece that we've been working on at Engage where I work is uh, the poly deploy, um, which we're uh, moving into DNN um, as a new extension called bulk install. Um, and we've been working on the deploy client uh, so that um, 
piece that you use to uh, send DNN packages to a DNN site to get them installed. Uh, typically, we're talking about running those during a, uh, a build pipeline um, in Azure DevOps or maybe GitHub Actions. And uh, there's uh, a current uh, deploy client for the poly deploy extension. Um, we've been uh, enhancing that and we have uh, a new version of that, which works both for the old poly deploy and um, is intended to work for the new uh, bulk install uh, if there's any renaming or anything that happens there with the actual APIs, there will be a little bit more work to do on the CLI side. Uh, so hope that you enjoy dependency injection, uh, new C Sharp features, and bulk install. Thanks. Thank you, Brian, for that excellent uh, presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions for Brian, well, you can't ask him right now, uh, but you could ask us and we'll try our best to answer uh, any of those. He's kind of smart, though, so uh, <laughs> don't get too deep on us. Now, we'll be happy to try to answer any questions that might be there. So in a nutshell, dependency injection will be available almost everywhere. Yep. <laughs> Brian made, I don't know how many pull requests. It seems like every other day he was doing some pull requests to add dependency injection to a new area <laughs> within DNN, which is really great. Really, really great. Uh, one of the things he was talking about there at the end, um, just out of curiosity, are, are you all familiar with PolyDeploy? Um, it was it was developed by Ken Terrace um, a while back. I think it was announced at a DNN summit, maybe, I don't know. Don't remember what year it was, maybe 2016 or something. I could probably look uh, back and see, but uh, I know a lot of people use that for being able to deploy remotely uh, more more than one module at a time with only one app recycle uh, for for the site, and uh, works really well uh, with that. But uh, Brian and uh, Engage they they use it extensively and. Uh, uh, a lot of the client improvements, uh, the client meaning the uh, the part of it that you can do behind the scenes through through CI um, to be able to to do that um, in a programmatic way. Uh, that they, they've improved that over the years and has done some work to uh, improve even more coming into DNN. Uh, and Brian, currently that project got handed over to. Um, the DNA community kind of to maintain uh, moving forward. And one of the first things to decide was to, yeah, that probably should be in DNN 10 eventually. So uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of put on the, put on the, um, the radar there. Um, Joe was, uh, was that a funny question or a real question? Cause I don't know what PD is. Uh, were there some issues with poly deploy. Oh, poly deploy? Oh, oh, no, not well, not really issues per se. Um, the the UI of poly deploy is written in Angular one. So um, not only do we not want to bring Angular in as a dependency in DNN to maintain, even if we were to bring Angular in, we definitely wouldn't bring in Angular one because they're at what Angular 17 or 18 now. Um, not my so, Dave, my question had to do with uh, something I was working on about a year ago. Uh, I think we got a command uh, from management who might not have understood, uh, but don't use polydeploy, and I can't remember why. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know Brian and them have done quite a bit. I mean, you can go out on still go out on GitHub DNN community and do a search for poly deploy. Yeah, and I, I can't honestly tell you which version uh, we were using. Um, 
Yeah, and a lot of people I don't think realize that Brian and them had a fork of the Canteris repo for a while mm-hmm. that they maintained um, because uh, Canteris wasn't really able to keep up with the you know community contributions uh, very much, and that's no slant on them whatsoever. It's just uh, kind of was a, a reality of theirs, and uh, so Brian and them had to kind of fork it in order to make some improvements. So a lot of people didn't even realize that version was out there. Well, anyways, the reason I bring that up is when Karen, when Kenteris moved or uh, transferred this over to the DNA community organization, uh, Brian and them rolled in all those changes that they had been maintaining in a fork into this one. So you should have a lot of that here. Is, um, is is this one current or is this one something that will be part of DNN 10? So we've already rolled in the as of, I think, hmm, I'd have to look at PRs to see when this actually happened, but I think about six months ago, oh, okay. whatever it was at that stage was rolled into DNN platform repo. So it's actually on a feature branch of DNN platform. Um, all that to say, it's probably in a little bit of a broken state. Um, but if you if you go to DNN platform and go to the feature slash bolt dash install, that's where it lives. So the client is actually here in this uh, directory. Okay, so something that was done maybe a year ago was probably using the Cantaris version. Was pro- yeah, it probably was using the Cantaris version and probably didn't realize that there were some fixes to security things and stuff like that in the forked version that engaged software had. Yeah, and like I said, I have no idea what the issues were. Mm, yeah. yeah. And that upper management was prone to not letting us do certain things that were just absolutely fine, but that's a that's a management issue. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully and, uh, those things will have been addressed in here, but if when it gets to a RC, anybody that knows how to use this would definitely appreciate any kind of testing there um, to try to identify any issues um, there before we get to a real release. And one of the things we want to do with this, because there's the UI management on the actual site, the target sites, you know, and then there's the CLI tool that you would use in your build pipelines to push your updates. And we want to make this into a new get package, which hasn't existed so far. So we had to have the runtime there and being able to have a new get package and storing credentials securely in your runner secrets or whatever. Uh, it's going to be a, a major uh, perk. And here's the new proposed UI. And this is really kind of rough wireframe uh, experience to anybody that's interested in it. We'd love your feedback on this, but at least that gets the core features in a little bit more usable uh, state than it is now because it's a little bit clunky um, working with it now. So all this is going to be rewritten using um, DNN elements, uh, which is, I know we've talked about it quite a bit, so I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, but like DNN elements has been being developed for how long now, Daniel? A couple of years. Yeah, you got and three years, I think. For all practical purposes, that really is part of DNN 10, but it's not literally going to be in the DNN platform repo because it, it it's better to consume it as a separate piece uh, coming in. But uh, if you're not familiar with that, check that out uh, too. But it's a bunch of uh, kind of a collection of components that you can use that are pure uh, web components, uh, HTML elements to be a little more exact there. And um, you can use them in any project, whether it's web forms or um, uh, spa or, you know. I have a quick question. Yeah. Will this be, um, will this UI exist in the persona bar or will you be able to put it on a page? This one here? Yeah. Uh, That will be. Probably in the persona persona bar. bar. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I'm just not a fan, so, okay. But I mean, the, that being said, it's it's kind of like not it, since it'll be rebuilt the way that it's going to be rebuilt, it won't be a big deal to be 
both if we wanted that to be, but I think mm -hmm. the decision was made for it to be Persona Bar, because this would be a host-only um, feature. Yeah. feature. Yeah, there is no good reason to make it to a module, but it wouldn't be very hard to. Right. Well, um, and in, in, in the interest of time, we'll move forward on to the next piece here. Um, and I'll try to keep this fairly quick, but I want to, this is kind of where you get to see a little bit of it, but I'll go ahead and warn you. I mean, as far as the experience goes in DNN, it's what you've learned to love or hate in DNN 9 as far as the persona bar. There's not a whole lot of changes, just some new um, features within that context, but the overall experience is the same. Uh, one of the big changes that, um, uh, from a look and feel standpoint, though, is to bring on a new theme. And we had several objectives in mind uh, when we come in that one. The content that was in the themes, it's okay, uh, but it was kind of an afterthought, uh, the content that is in the default template uh, for the site, but we want to make that a little more user-friendly for, especially for first-time users of DNN. Those of us have been using it for years, you probably rarely even install a default thing. I mean, the default template anymore, you're probably installing blank template, um, but nonetheless, you would get Exilion as the default theme. Um, that was great for a long time, but it had everything in the kitchen sink in it. Um, and you know, everything that you can dream of doing <laughs> in a, in a theme pretty much, uh, um, general stuff anyways is, uh, was included in that. So it was quite heavy and the way that it was done made it quite difficult to maintain, uh, especially as it relates to CSS framework that was using bootstrap not just Bootstrap, but Bootstrap 3. Um, so it is still has Bootstrap 3 for many reasons because, well, it would be a breaking change if we were to update Bootstrap in Exilion to be Bootstrap 4 or Bootstrap 5. It would break people's content for people that have used Exilion. So, you know, it. I don't think the intent was really ever there for people to use Exilion. Um, as a starting point for their theme, but a lot of people did. So one of the objectives for the new theme was to be, well, do we want people to be able to use whatever the default is in DNN to use that to create their own themes? Well, yeah, that would be great, wouldn't it? Um, but we need it in a maintainable way. So the big objective was to not use a framework at all so that it would be easier to be maintained. And then people could do whatever they wanted to with their own copies of this theme. So that was one objective, no, no CSS framework. Um, the, and by no CSS framework, I really mean no third party, you know, framework like a bootstrap or like a uh, tailwind or something like that to bring in no foundation CSS um, to, to make sure that it's all encapsulated right in the thing. Two was to, have an actual build system in place for the theme so that people could use it to, well, not only make it easier for us to maintain moving forward, but also for people that wanted to use it as a starting point for their own themes, they would have a build system in place already to use um, for that. And um, let's see the content to be kind of more strategic to first time users. So let me do this. Let me, uh, Open up my uh, Visual Studio code here and give me just a little bit and I'll give you a walkthrough of just kind of the build environment um, for this real quick. So um, if you are familiar with where this is in DNN, you go to DNN platform folder in the main repo. Let me clap some things down here so that it's out of the way. I'll get the build stuff down. So you've got build and then you've got DNM platform and then we've got skins. So within here, uh, you'll see the new theme is Aperture. Uh, we, oh yeah, that was another objective to a name that people could actually spell and say and <laughs> you know kind of a common common thing, but it does have some some meaning to it as well. Um, you know a, a theme, you know kind of like a camera you know, the, the aperture of a lens, you know, to be able to focus on the content and so forth. 
uh, kind of seemed to resonate. Uh, we, we did put a poll out there with quite a few people that chimed in and said, yeah, I like this one. I like this one. I think we even talked about it on a Southern Fried one time and uh, or maybe it was something else. I don't know. Maybe it was a co-coding session uh, on Discord, but uh, Aperture is kind of where we landed on that. But if you look at the Axillion theme, you'll see a lot of it's kind of old school, including use of a CS project file and things like that um, for the build system was using MS build. So it was kind of old, you know, in that regard, not really leveraging a lot of front end, uh, modern front end tooling on that. And just a lot of stuff in there. In Aperture, what you're gonna see is, and I'll kind of expand this down or collapse this down. Um, in package JSON, you'll see that there are very few dependencies and the dependencies that we do have are all dev dependencies, except for one, which is normalized CSS. And before DNN 10 releases, our thought process is that this is going to be gone as well. So there will actually be zero dependencies uh, distributed at the end. Um, everything will be a dev dependency. And it's very small. Most of it is related to rollup, which is, if you're not familiar with rollup.js, it is a... It's similar, I would say, to Webpack. Um, that's probably the closest well-known one. That, wouldn't you say, Daniel? That's probably about the closest to explain it. It's more configuration-based. Um, um, it's natively TypeScript-based, and like, it, yeah, it's configuration in a, in a settings a class. So it's actually is using using a class, and most plugins are really, really simple and bare metal. So it's uh, pretty cool and fast. Super fast. You'll see here in just a minute, actually, the dev environment running. So between rollup, I mean, most of those dependencies are rollup, some, some typings uh, in here, and a globbing to be able to do glo globbing patterns, a TypeScript, SAS compiler, and something to zip up. And that's used with rollup as well to create the install package uh, um, for, for the theme as well. So other than that, there's really not much to it except for browser sync. And this is really important for the dev experience. Uh, browser sync allows you to do a live reload of DNN um, while you're working on the theme. So any change to your file will reflect immediately in the theme. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of go from there. But if you've done any development in DNN front end kind of stuff, like any of the persona bar modules or something, you'll, you'll know doing yarn watch dash dash scope and then the name that is in package json here which is aperture that's actually going to because my dev files here is not where my local dnn instance is for development right so this is going to make sure that any changes that i do here are reflected in my dnn instance uh, for the aperture thing but it's going to be scoped directly to that so I'll run this up and it'll actually uh, spin up DNN 10, which has already been built um, and is in some state that's getting ready for me to update the templates uh, for for this. It'll take just a second to, to load up. And then once it's loaded, it's a live reload kind of experience. So it's really nice. While that's... Uh, spinning up there. <clears throat> I'll just walk through real quickly kind of the layout of things. You got containers, which only has two containers, one with title and one without title. Uh, we got some partial uh, user controls here for various sections on the page and includes and being able to register um, skin objects <clears throat> and so forth. And the menu structure is just using DDR menus and there's three different menus in here. Uh, one's for desktop, one for mobile, and one is for the footer of the site. So what this is doing is it's starting up DNN, but it is proxying it through localhost. Dot, I mean, localhost with port 3000 here. And there is the new theme look and feel uh, for the site with content already placed in it. That's going to be the what the content is delivered in the default uh, theme or template, excuse me, I keep saying theme for template. 
but it's uh, pretty clean, uh, straightforward, good content uh, to help people get to places they need. If you need to learn uh, DNN 10, you can get to the various docs areas there. You need to know how to extend DNN. You got real quick way to get to a lot of GitHub uh, locations based on the topic of DNN CMS, as well as getting to the DNN store for those that still use that. Um, being able to participate in the community, some of the various things like Slack and Discord and GitHub, DNN community site, DNN community forms on the DNN community site, the blogs on the community site, and DNN docs. Talk a little bit about the events with some pictures to actually connect people to the real community. Um, one kind of human element that has been missing in the past on, on some of the content. And so it's a pretty basic uh, theme, but highly powerful. Uh, the navigation system, um, why is that not working now, Daniel? <laughs> it's not doing smooth scrolling all of a sudden. I may because be on the wrong Because you're doing branch. a demo. <laughs> yep, the demo guides. Oh, I'm on the wrong branch. Um, oh, great. Um, give me just a second here and I'll fix this. Let's see, should be in DNM platform, skins. Uh, oh, I don't need to go that far. Just need to go that far. And then I probably need to pull the latest. Hit pull uh, upstream uh, release. There we go. There's the files I needed for this. So it should hot reload. Uh, force. And when you scroll now, it should be smooth scrolling. There we go. Now our smooth scrolling is working uh, on this. Now that's the top level. This sub will not be there, but this was just to start testing out some of the inner workings of the menu there, as well as the menus down at the bottom. Do that as well. So out of the box, it'll kind of do that. Um, looking at the responsive view of this. Let me just get it out of mobile and I'll manually move it. <clears throat> so all the content's nice and responsive in here, but not using any external uh, CSS framework for that. And you'll see how the, the menu changes here. It's kind of a push out uh, experience here that you would expect more on a mobile device these days. Um, if you need to drill down, it'll just overlay right on top and come back. And the smooth scrolling still works just fine here, but closes out your menu for you and so forth. The markup for the <clears throat> for the content in here is pretty straightforward as well. Uh, and I don't I won't take up too much too much more time here because of uh, timing of everything. I want to give everybody else some time here, but uh, Markup is pretty straightforward and simple here. So you may remember from like the existing uh, content that's in the default template, it's actually quite complicated, the content. <clears throat> and if you breathe on it hard and hit save, you're going to break it. I, I mean, people have done that, have changed just a little thing in the content, and then you hit save and it's gone. Well, thank you to CK Edit, our implementation of CK Editor for that. But in this case, you it will not break on you unless you do something really that's not good um, in here. But the markup, ignore the styling on this stuff here. We still got a little bit of cleanup to do there. But let me just make this bigger so you can kind of see the markup here. Everything is just classed by the by the theme name. So it's it's following a pattern that for those that have used Bootstrap will recognize some of it. So basically, there's your Bootstrap esque. Um, classes, so container, your flex stuff for like a line item center, deflex, but it's all prefixed, prefixed with aperture dash, um, flex column, flex large, these are your breakpoints and so forth, but the content is nice and simple, no magicianry really going on here except for what's in the classes behind the scenes and even the divider there, the fancy kind of arrow two color divider thing there is is classed as well. And that does purvey all the way down uh, through all this. As far as theme um, uh, containers 
go. No, sorry, not containers, but content panes. We only have a few. There's a banner pane. There's a content pane, which is contained inside of the content area automatically, so you don't have to class it as such. And then you've got a fluid pane for all the rest of the um, fluid-based things and all the content in this case is handled through fluid panes. And then you have a footer pane down here, which has uh, the ability to put content in as well. So pretty straightforward for that. Um, last thing I wanted to kind of mention here as far as the theme goes, it, and this is probably be a good segue into what Daniel Velotis is going to, or Velotis, excuse me, Velotis. Uh, was that was that French enough? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. The Portuguese, actually. <laughs> Portuguese, yeah, okay. Velotis <laughs> um, is going to talk a little bit about, but you'll you'll remember I I had something in here for like BG dash neutral. You may be saying, well, what the heck is neutral? Um, in the theme right now, we're currently injecting uh, CSS variables here, but Daniel's going to talk a little bit more about what the greater plan is for that. But in the source here. Where did I? Somewhere. Uh, very Somewhere. <laughs> Colors. Colors. That was it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, these are getting injected manually right now, but you have an entire color system, essentially, that are going to um, be injected in the, the root of the page as CSS variables. So you have primary, primary light, primary dark, primary contrast, mm -hmm. and then primary, the R, G, and B broken out. Uh, in numbers there. So you basically have that for primary, secondary, tertiary, neutral, background, foreground, info, success, warning, danger, Will Robinson. Yep. And then you also have a couple of others that are going to be um, for like radius on buttons and various controls uh, within DNN as well as padding. There may be more, but for right now, that's kind of the color and style system that's going to be put in there. But Daniel, I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about that. And I'm yes, you want me to stop? Uh, don't no, don't sharing. stop your share. Let's okay. um, let's transition from you to me. If you can go back to the theme, yeah, like the the preview of the theme, and uh, open up DevTools. And if you change your CSS uh, variable definition of primary, secondary, just to show uh, the overall idea. So right there, what you see on David's screen on the root with all the definitions. So if your branding is red or orange or purple. Let me go down on the page there. So we there we see, go. See so changing only your branding colors will affect everything that consumes them. So that could be the theme. That could be all the modules in the persona bar will consume that. And third parties, instead of enforcing some sort of design system, we are just offering this. So consume it if you want to match the, the site branding preference. And this would be per site. So that's our new way of providing enough to have a consistent look without enforcing something on designers or uh, team developers. You might have very specific reasons to not use this, or you want to just match the branding. So that's the overall idea. Now, uh, this will be available as a UI, so you won't be uh, you won't need to be a coder to do this. So if you decide to create a DNN site and you want to customize them, now I could share my screen when you are ready. So here, screen three, there we go. So that connects with DNN elements, which are currently used in the resource manager. So you see the resource manager currently is blue themed and stuff because it's the DNN primary color. So that will match your branding color. And uh, DNN elements is a collection of all kinds of controls that are not tied into a specific framework. So a button is a button, it's not React, it's not Angular, it's an HTML element. And they are very loosely coupled to DNN. They're, they could be used anywhere. What we name it DNN for is that they will use those DNN CSS variables. Uh, 
So your buttons, your checkboxes, your everything will be uh, of a consistent style if you decide to use this. Uh, in the NN10, there will be a host module uh, that will allow to customize the branding colors and it will use color picker. Uh, it's going to be basically a repeater of a form with color pickers, uh, but we don't want to have like uh, 12 color pickers like this. So there is a color input that we have created, um, a color input that basically has a preview of the color with a picker to go, whoops, that doesn't work nice inside of Storybook. Oh, you can go <clears> on <throat> the uh, other one. Yeah. There you go. Now, now it can work. So you get a preview and you get your color picker and you go one color at a time and that will be what shows up in the form and it supports a label and a health text and it also supports defining two colors. So your primary and your primary contrast. So what we mean by that is give us a color that is highly readable over your color. So if you're into a light color, you might want to have a dark contrast over it. So that gives you a preview. So, okay, this thing makes sense, you know? And because we also provide a light color, then there is another mode for this input, which allows you to choose three color variations and the contrast all in one with a preview. So if my branding is orange, I can kind of define a medium orange and a lighter version of that. There's a copy, so maybe I haven't played with this yet. Um, we should the fix. Only for um, X. Yeah, the copy is only on X, right? So I could we should paste this here. There's, the it's not. Yeah. Yep, <laughs> that's the zoom link. That didn't work. It's been a while since that was the very first component yes. that we developed. So uh, <laughs> it may need a little bit of TLC. <laughs> yes. But basically, you can edit your RGB colors, you can copy or paste X values, and you also have U saturation lightness. So if I want to keep exactly the same U, I can just like uh, increase my lightness until I see it's enough of a difference. And okay, that would be my light. And so for same thing for the dark. I'm just going to like pick something. And then I would need a color, a contrast that's going to work on this. And usually you want your contrast to be neutral, but they don't have to be. So if I'd like to make my contrast blue over the orange, I could, you know. But it allows you to preview this and make sure, yeah, that's going to look okay in any module and uh, uh, theme and whatever for the primary, secondary, tertiary, and uh, so on and so forth, your danger colors and stuff like this. Um, so this is a module that will be developed for that purpose. And that module will be developed using the NN elements. And it will affect, as of speaking right now, the resource manager, this module, the team, and uh, time providing, we will go back to the React common components and make them consume this. So now you're also having a, a a constant style in the persona bar, everything that's in the persona bar currently that uses those React wrappers. And for those that want to control this, you know, in a more hard-coded kind of way, can do so in their theme, you know, by just overriding mm. those CSS variable var values. Yes. Uh, within there. But DNN will spit them out at the root as the HTML, so that's your ultimate fallback, and you can also overwrite them on a uh, on a node. So if you're doing a module and you want to do this, but you want to overwrite something, you could, and it's going to affect only your module, which is pretty cool, also. Exactly. And uh, the new user interface for uh, Poly Deploy that David showed earlier will also be using. These controls, uh, what did we have there that was interesting? Uh, While well, the buttons that you saw were Progress using the buttons, bar, progress bars, yeah. yeah. So, what you saw earlier in the mock ups were the progress bars. Uh, it's going to be using uh, these progress bars, which use the color system. So, everything is going to be uh, uh, looking about the same. And I think we had tabs. So, the tabs are available here. And uh, yeah. 
That's what I have for 10. So having seen kind of what Daniel's talking about here, now you can kind of bring it full circle back to the theme. One of the ideas in the design of the theme was to keep it simple enough, but yet powerful enough for you to have a really strong starting point for any kind of custom theme development. Um, so let's say you wanted to bring in a framework for your own theme development, well, you could still use this build system and just bring in your framework, you know, via package management and use it. Um, so it really would be very minimal effort to bring in something like a bootstrap or even a tailwind into this. Of course, tailwind's a different paradigm altogether, right? Um, as far as getting what you want in there, um, but from a build standpoint, it, it should be fairly trivial to uh, to do that. But it's a nice block design that could be tweaked in little ways here and there. I guess I could show the last little bit here. Um, I was going to show uh, in the file system, basically you've got your, you know, you, you only have one layout here with some includes for the various um, partials in here, but you could easily add additional layouts, but you see how clean this is. There's not much to it. Same thing in the partials. They're very clean. Uh, so you can, edit those as you see fit, move things around um, within that. But your the bulk of the work is really in the SAS architecture here. And what you've got here um, beyond your variables here are sections, which, you know, SAS just for the footer, SAS for just the header. And these are kind of mapped to the partials directly. So it makes it, you know, makes sense. Everything's kind of wrapped in this scope of a, of a theme here. So it's bringing the header and footer into the, to the theme here to make it easier to manage uh, your SAS. Got one in here for the pop-up scan if you use pop-ups. And then these are just individual components. This file right here is probably the worst file in the whole thing. And the idea is that this is going <laughs> to go away. But many of you are familiar with the kind of basic DNN styling stuff that's been adapted over the years. Most people have some shape, form, or fashion of this. But Daniel's work <clears throat> that's uh, one thing I forgot you, to mention. Yeah, yeah, why don't you mention the default CSS work that you were... So as part of DNN 10, we can afford to have some breaking changes. So one of them will be default CSS. We want to highly reduce it. So that is three part or four part. So old browsers, we don't test anymore for them. So anything that was made for IE 10, all kinds of workarounds are getting out of default CSS. Um, Everything that is unused in default CSS from a clean DNN installation. So it used to have all kinds of the core modules CSS in here. We are pulling all that out uh, from default CSS and it's the responsibility of the modules to have it. And stuff that is still used in DNN, but does not show up um, on the homepage, let's say are going to get extracted into the, the right place. So they only load if needed. One example of that would be a login, um, uh, the search scan object, these things, they, they don't have to be there. So they should move from default CSS into that skin object or into that module. Uh, there's a bunch of things for social that need to go into social modules. Uh, so there's a massive cleanup that will happen in the default CSS. And the ultimate goal, but from a theme perspective, is that this file may even be able to be completely removed, if not greatly reduced, uh, as a result of that effort. Um, and then lastly is kind of, you may be wondering, okay, well, you did all those things that look like bootstrap, but how did you pull those off? Well, there are some utility classes in here. It's not full-blown bootstrap here. Um, but it's just basic stuff to be able to, like, for instance, handle the background colors. So this integrates with the color system, does a mix in so that you can be able to do aperture dash background, BG dash, whatever the color name is, primary, secondary, tertiary, or whatever. Same thing, rinse and repeat for all the various uh, things, including breakpoint uh, type stuff. So let me figure out something that's got breakpoints in it. Yeah, something, this one's a complicated one, but... <clears throat> Essentially, there are mix-ins here to handle your breakpoints for the various things so that you get a naming convention like aperture-flex-whatever-your-breakpoint-is-whatever-direction. dash flex dash whatever your breakpoint is dash whatever direction. So if you can imagine, hey, I want this to turn from row to column at some certain breakpoint, 
then you can do that just through class definitions here. So um, it's not, <laughs> this was a little bit more than I thought we were going to end up <laughs> doing. And this is the opinionated part of the, of the, of the theme um, is I really wanted the content at the end of the day on the site to be very clean markup and not, but still have some benefit to those building DNN insights that want to use this as their starting point. So it's, it, it's powerful enough to, to be able to have a little mini built in framework, but at least this way we can maintain our own and evolve that, you know, as needed over time. Um, any questions on the theme aspect of it? We've got one more piece of this too. Uh, on here, but any questions on the uh, theme or any of the stuff that Daniel was talking about with the CSS variables or um, default CSS? All right. So the last piece here that we have. Uh, there was one question here is the new DNN community site sharing team style elements from the perspective <laughs> aperture or vice versa, currently not. That's the best answer we can provide right now. Yep. Um, any other ones? Uh, yeah, see, there's a lot of chat stuff over here, but I haven't been able to keep up with it. Too busy talking. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to keep an eye on it since you're talking. Uh, so, yeah, it was uh, uh, the DNN community team was started before this got started. And it's a bit of a different challenge because content relies on bootstrap there. And it's a bit There's a of lot a of diverse content, context. content yeah. out there that's built in different ways by different people. So yeah, standardization of this kind of comes down to, <clears throat> I mean, we've got basic content here, right? And there was a clear strategy uh, to be able to support yeah. it. So it was easy to standardize. Mm. Uh, whereas community site, not quite so simple. Okay. Um, last on the agenda, um, for those that are interested in this piece, there's a new feature coming in to uh, DNN 10 uh, called API tokens. And I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'm going to let Peter's uh, video here roll. Uh, this is out on YouTube under the stay at home DNNer moniker uh, out there. So um, if you do have to drop, feel free to do so. But I'm going to let Peter, it is a little bit long, but it's a kind of a complicated area that required a lot of <laughs> demoing. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and let that roll. Well, hello, everyone. Um, if I'm correct, we should be live in Everybody YouTube this okay? at the moment. Um, this is a short video I'm making for a meeting tonight of Southern Fried DNN. Um, where several features of DNN 10 are being explained. And one of those features uh, was made by me, which is the support for API tokens in DNN. Now, API tokens, just briefly an explanation about the why of, the, of API tokens. Um, we all know API tokens uh, that we use to integrate our software with uh, other bits of software. Uh, think, for instance, of GitHub or think of um, Strava. In case you want to connect your app to Strava, you need to create an API key, put it in the, uh, the third-party software, and that third-party software can then extract data from uh, that service uh, about you. Um, I, I've worked on several uh, larger uh, DNN projects where, you know, with, with, with a complex set of modules um, where it was important that uh, it would integrate with uh, other bits of software. And until now, there wasn't much uh, we could do except uh, hack the JWT token authentication uh, mechanism that is there. Uh, but that is a hack. Uh, where you make that token just live longer uh, than 20 minutes, uh, right? Because it, it, in the end, it's it's uh, annoying if you have to renew a token all the time um, when you're talking about long-term integration of one bit of software with whatever you've built on DNN. So hence the, the need for API tokens came along. Now, the work that's gone into it, um, mm. technically, 
I, I think, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't consider it a huge uh, task. Um, what was more of a challenge was to properly design it and uh, take care of um, everyone's sensibilities when it comes to uh, the sensitivities as it comes to to um, to security. Uh, obviously, the idea that there might be a character string out there that would give you access to the inner workings of DNN um, quite rightly freaked out a bunch of people uh, as I set about this journey to negotiate with everyone like, okay, how are we going to do this? Um, what would work? Uh, what, what do you think would be a safe, uh, safe mechanism? Um, so in this short presentation, I would like just to step through uh, um, how, you know, how, how this is uh, stepped up, the, 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 how it's created this, this, um, this API token functionality. Uh, or how to enable it, let's say, which is a it's a multi-step uh, process. So for that, I have a DNN10 uh, installation running, which I will now share. Let's have a look. We'll go to there. You go. Okay, folks, share that. So if I'm correct, you should see the uh, this uh, a, a, a DNN10 uh, alpha version installed here. And um, the first thing we'll need to do is to enable this whole token functionality in the web.config. So we're going to go to the uh, config manager and in the config manager, we'll select the web.config and somewhere towards the bottom, we've got our auth systems. Let's have a look for something. <clears throat> not that, not authentication, not permissions, not modern caching, not that. Um, all, all services, there you go. This part is what you're looking for. And as you can see, a new entry will have been made. Um, API token auth type dot new web API auth API token auth message handler. And by default, this is set to false, enabled to false. So you will need to set enable to true. Um, default include can be true. And force SSL is uh, by default set to true, and it should be true. But for demo purposes, as I'm not using uh, a, a secure website, I will need to set it to false. Otherwise, I can't demo what it does for you. So um, once that's been enabled, um, it now becomes available to the site as well and to the installation as a whole. All of that happens under, uh, under the security tab. So um, as you can see the security tab, we have under more, we now have API token settings. And here we have a setting to allow API tokens on this specific website for a maximum time span of a year and where the user API token time span, a user can't actually specify their own time span for an API token, or they can, depending on your integration software, um, of 30 days. All right. So once we've set that up, um, the API tokens are now available both on the, let's say, installation uh, a wide scope as well as this specific portal scope. Um, and now we can start creating tokens ourselves. So let's say we have, uh, we would like to add a token. So I'm going to call this token uh, test one token. And I'm going to give it a scope of host. As you can see, there are three scopes defined. Host site user, and the, and this follows the basic DNN philosophy of you have the installation as a whole with with a specific uh, you know security level that you need to access that, which is you know the super user. We have a site level um, operation which would require you to have uh, an admin level uh, access to that site, 
right, to be an administrator of the site. And then the final level is user level. So that's you know, whatever authenticated user in the system. So we're just going to start with a host level key. So I'm going to expire that in 180 days. And I'm going to allow that, uh, that API key to access this API. So I'll, I'll come to what is listed here in, in a moment when you see what, what I've created. And it will create a key. Now I am going to copy that key and um, just write it down somewhere. I am going to go to, let's see. Oh. It takes one. You just paste it there and make sure we don't forget that one. And because as soon as we click away this window, uh, that key is gone forever. Right? It's stored in the database, uh, hashed, so there's no way to actually retrieve it again after the fact. If you lose it, you're going to have to delete it and recreate uh, the key. So now this application has been opened up uh, through an API key. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop this share and I'm going to go to the Visual Studio uh, project um, I made. Uh, it's a little library to test this functionality. So it's a DLL that was dropped into the bin folder of the website and it has a uh, here we go. It has a the route mapper will tell us that uh, any route uh, mapped to test tokens test lib um, will be mapped to whatever controller it can find in this namespace, right? And so we should have a route of test tokens slash test lib slash test from test controller, and then. We've got here, we've got test one, test two, and test three. We've got three different API endpoints. Now, the, uh, the way this works is as a module developer, you will uh, give this web API endpoint uh, an API token authorized attribute. And this attribute specifies three things. It specifies a name for it and a resource file. Now, I'll explain to you why this is important in a second. Hang on a second. That should not happen. Right. And what level of authentication is required. So, in this case, for test one, it's host. For test two, it's portal level. And for test three, it's user level. Uh, scope. So we're just going to focus on test one at the moment. It's set to be at a host level, and we want to go to that method. So I'm going to get out of here and now go to my Thunder client. Let's look. Here we go. That one. So now you can see we can. We can call, uh, this is the URL to the website, um, API, we've got the test token slash test lib, that was the base path, and then test controller and then test one method. If I do not add any authentication, of course, that should return no, not unauthorized. However, if I now add the token that I copied just earlier, which is that one, then if all goes well, that should say, that should give us access now. Now, so that's, that's okay. If just change it to slightly, obviously it will fail. Also, if I try to access test two, that should fail. And test three, that should fail because the scopes do not match. So it's important to understand that even though in DNM normally uh, host is let's say the boss and decides everything and can do anything on anyone's behalf in the API token uh, uh, solution, 
what will it, it doesn't quite work that way. It means the but there the scopes need to match from the method, the web API endpoint to the scope that the key was created. Now, the reason we uh, used the name and uh, resource file is that if we want to show to the end user, we want to give them some feedback on what API point endpoints they're actually authorizing the API token for, we need to show some kind of a text. And obviously that's done through uh, through the resource file mechanism as we do everything in DNN. So you can you should have a, a resource file somewhere with your solution that you point your uh, your label to and tell it, okay, this is test one dot text. So first API endpoint is the English name for it. And that will mean that when I go back and I go to the uh, DNN installation, oops, that's going there, that when we create an endpoint, we're going to go for test number two, right? And that's going to be portal one. Then I can see that the second API endpoint has been detected uh, by the system and it's found it in the resource file and therefore is able to display that. Uh, text here uh, to give the user the best feedback for that. Um, so we have that key. I'm just going to copy it and I'm going to paste it. Yep. To cancel out of it. And now I'm going to go to the Visual Studio Code again. And now we're going to go to the second endpoint. And here again, authorize. There you go. That's the old key that was there. That's been denied. Of course, without it, that's denied as well. And pasting that key that we just created. And now it should work. Now, the interesting thing is that for the third one, um, it's a user endpoint. And so there it is presumed that we have a user context. And uh, this is wrong one, just let me get the right one here. Um, let's have a look at the, at the controller again. So with the third endpoint here at the user, we actually can make use of the user info display name. Uh, you can use it in the other ones, but it's kind of nonsensical because the API keys are created as a tool to access data either across the entire portal or uh, across the entire installation. So here the portal context should be uh, should you know should be valid. So the portal ID that you find here is the portal ID for the, which this was authenticated. And here we get the user for whom, and the portal, of course, for whom this was authenticated. So if I create a, uh, a third key now, and, and say, well, okay, let's have one for this user. And that would be for me, in this case, the super user. Right. It's just going to be a user key done for 30 days, third endpoint. Okay, add it. I'm going to copy that out. Okay. And we're going to switch to the uh, code here. We go to the third endpoint. And I'm going to go to the authentication here. Where is the kind of way that? Send it. And it says hello from test three or use super user account. So the uh, anyone using that key would now uh, have that user uh, be the user in the subsequent code. So as a developer, you always need to you know, keep this in mind whenever you are developing solutions on top of this. Um, what is what is the authenticated scope that I'm that I'm working with? All right, so in a nutshell, that is 
that is being rolled out in uh, DN10. Um, I know I'll be using it in a few projects. And uh, yeah, uh, if you have any questions about this, uh, feel free to reach out to me. All right. Thank you, Peter. Uh, if I can figure out how to get out of this. Is everybody still awake? <laughs> I think uh, there was a moment for multitasking there. Um, really cool stuff, though, for, for some use cases. Um, I have not tried this myself in any of this and don't have any apparent use cases for it, but I'm sure the, may, the light bulbs may come on a little bit later on. I would say ask you questions. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to answer them, but I can definitely get you in touch with Peter <laughs> if you uh, if you have the, those questions. Anybody have anything specific or any comments about the new API tokens? All righty. Well, that actually concludes all the planned uh, stuff. So I'll just kind of open it up for general general thoughts, questions on DNN 10. Are you excited? Are you horrified? Are you uh, eager uh, to see it happen? Uh, what, what, what's, what's the thoughts? Oh, thank you, Jeremy. Applause, applause. No, this is awesome. I mean, there's so many things here. I had one question because I think Daniel Villada's, I don't know how to pronounce that anymore, but uh, <laughs> have you looked at the PolySharp and is that something that with Code Dom? we'd be able to get that to seep into DNN so that some of the code could start using newer C-sharp language stuff? Yes. Um, hmm. I, <clears throat> I have looked at it from the perspective of an, of an extension. Um, and basically, it's not something that, that DNN would provide because uh, with PolySharp, it happens at compile time. So... We could do it in DNN, which would affect what DNN compiles. But for third parties that compile their own stuff, that would be on them. I had it working perfectly, but it didn't uh, happen on uh, Ubuntu runners. So that is something that is supposed to work. And I'll need to play with it a little extra to figure out how to um, jiggle the handles right. Okay, good. Because I played with it too, and I did get it to work in the yeah. DNN context, and got some code compiling that actually did something in C sharp ten, and I mm -hmm. was blown away. But then I started to realize how many different places DNN would need to incorporate this and test it, and it became yeah. quickly overwhelming. So yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm glad there's awareness on that because. Mm -hmm. You guys know I've been a big fan of code dom and using <laughs> yeah. three, so I guess uh to kind of wrap things up let, I mean if anybody else has any comments, please interrupt me. Uh but to kind of wrap things up that the only other big ticket items that are really kind of remaining for DN and ten uh beyond documentation needs um for a lot of this cool stuff is really um, going to try to get the, the bulk install uh, module rewritten, the UI on that, the poly deploy. Um, and then Daniel's got some just finishing work to do on some the default CSS stuff, the CSS variables, the module for managing the color system and the uh, radius and padding uh, stuff. And um, that's the only really uh, big things that are that are left. Uh, I think you have a a bug out there, Daniel, for running on SQL Server 2017. To the, need to be looked at at some point. But uh, what does that mean really for the timeline on this? Not really sure uh, uh, on that. But it seems like it's going to be sooner than later. Uh, but you know, my guess is you could probably depend on it happening before DNN Connect. Um, but definitely 
after the end in summit, I can't see it happening, you know, in the next few weeks. Um, as a, as so. an outsider, I would highly recommend you promise it for 2024, and that's all you say. <laughs> yeah, well, there's so. no promising at all, actually. It's just soon. Uh, <laughs> we'll even give you a shirt sticker uh, for that, <laughs> and then soon. Um, no, it, it'll be fun to see see some uh, new newness uh, breathed into the end. So. Um, and that, of course, that comes with all the wonderful, uh, it, you know, some of the things we didn't talk about was a lot of the, the API removals and things like that. So that's, that, that actually means something for the footprint of DNN, too, you know, and removing those deprecated um, APIs and all that. Is there so, going to be a, a recap of the what are true breaking changes, the stuff people will probably trip over if they're not careful? Is there a solid recap of that somewhere? Or is that too hard to put together after all this? So for a third-party developer, you we backported a lot of documentation into the latest nine, and it was part of the reason of a, a nine twelve three, and we're gonna do the same just before releasing ten. There's gonna be a last nine release if there's anything to document. Now, for other things, it's gonna be in the release notes. Okay, sounds good to me. I don't really know the number of APIs that are being removed off the top of my head on that. I know a lot of that work was really done a long time ago, marking those. Um, so yeah. I, I don't really know off the top of my head how much that is. But my guess is, is it won't be anywhere near as painful as it was for 9.2. So yep. that I remember clearly. <laughs> that made a lot of people sad. <laughs> yep. For, for those of us who have fairly... Um, I'll call it vanilla DNN installations. You know, we use the basic DNN, we throw in some too sexy. I have a feeling that the transition is just going to be pretty easy. Me that too. we'll mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see we'll see better performance because there's less crap being pulled along and uh, things are optimized. But I don't. I'm not expecting any nightmares. I'm not actually anticipating any challenges at all except working through all my websites and upgrading them. Just I really the time think that the takes. difference is going to be whether or not the module vendor is still active. If they're active, it should be a smooth transition. If they're not, you're probably in trouble. Yeah, yeah I think, Steve, really to, to, to your sentiment there, I mean, if, if you're sticking with the basic stuff of, you know, like DNN plus two sexy and maybe some of the major like Mendeeps or yeah, and easy getting new solutions like that. You know, I'm not sure how much those are actually paying attention to what's going on, you know, for DNN 10 yet, but, you know, we're trying to make every effort as possible to make sure they know well, what's going on. But uh, my guess is, is you're going to be fine, you know, with, with anything that's more common like that. I think installations that have custom stuff that hasn't been maintained for years, then, you know, they got a little bit of a potential challenge there as well as some, you know, just rogue modules or uh, modules from vendors that don't, not around anymore or, you know, stuff like that. And I assume people should feel comfortable staying on DNN 9 for a while, correct? Well, I'm never going to say that. Uh, upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, theoretically, yes. You just well, don't know well, what new security stuff is going to happen, you know, that exactly. would impact. So, while 9.13.12 is deemed as secure today, that doesn't mean that next month it's going to be secure because there might be something that was discovered, you know. Understood. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I know the meetup tonight was a little bit longer than we have been doing the last uh, last year or so, but uh, it was probably worth it <laughs> to uh, to get to see some of this stuff in, in action there, at least in uh, kind of prep for for what's what's yet to come so thanks everybody for joining us we'll go ahead and stop the recording hope you have a wonderful evening or morning or whatever it is wherever you are and if you're watching us on youtube thanks for doing that uh let us know in comments below if you have questions i try to monitor those as much as possible and if i don't know the answer i uh, will try to get you to somebody that does know the answer so uh thanks for uh thanks for joining us everybody have a great one yep Thank you, everyone. See you at see you at DNN Summit, and then we'll talk to you again next month after Summit's over. Awesome. See you guys. Bye bye. Yeah.